In this video, we'll understand how a real world data science or a machine learning project is handled end to end. And we'll understand the full life cycle of a project from the start to the very end, right? So let's go step by step so that you get a better idea of how in the real world a machine learning project is managed. If you're a working employee, you might have already heard of software development life cycle. And a lot of computer science students learn that in subjects like software engineering, right? Very similar to SDLC, where we learn how a piece of software or a software engineering project is developed. There is also there are some guidelines around how a data science or a machine learning project needs to be understood, right? Or understood and solved end to end actually. So the first thing, the very, very important thing is to understand the business requirements. This is extremely important. So in this, in this stage, you define what is a problem. You understand who is the customer for whom you are building this whole machine learning or data science or deep learning project. Understanding the requirements is super, super critical. Again, remember that we have, we have like 10, 11 steps here. In some companies, all the 11 steps would have to be done by only the data science folks. In some companies, you may have program managers, product managers, software engineers who will take up some of these. This is typically like a product managerial role where, where you would go and talk to all the customers or all the business units that you will develop the solution for, understand their core problem. Because if you're trying to solve a problem that they don't care about, or that is of very little business value to them, it's all useless. You're just putting in your effort at the wrong place, right? In the wrong endeavor. So it is better for you to understand the business requirements and especially the customer. Who is my customer for whom I'm building it? And what is the value proposition that I'm, that, that I'm, actually, uh, that I'm actually providing to the end user? The end user could be a customer internal to the company or external to the company, right? And remember, this may, in some cases, because the problem could be very vague. You might have multiple rounds of discussions. You might go back to your drawing table, come back, understand the problem. This could, I mean, I've had instances where just understanding this could take weeks. Okay, because you don't want to solve the wrong problem or the, or the useless problem, right? So it again depends on context to context. And all the 11 steps we mentioned may or may not be there in every project. There might be projects where the business requirement is extremely clear. You don't have to you don't have to, again, go back and talk to everybody. It's explicitly there, right? Again, the amount of effort that needs to be spent in each prop, in each stage of this life cycle could differ from project to project, team to team, company to company, etc. But these are the general guidelines, right? Once you understand the business requirements, the next very important step is acquiring the data or the data acquisition stage, right? This acquisition stage is typically done using ETL queries. ETL stands for extract, transform, and load, right? These are the three steps that you typically perform in acquiring data. And the most popular tool that is used for data acquisition is SQL, right? It's, it's a very, very popular tool. Your data may be sitting in databases like Oracle databases or MySQL databases or data warehouses, right? Or it could be just a bunch of log files sitting on a bunch of servers. Or as very recently, what's been happening over the last decade is a lot of this data is sitting on Hadoop and Spark clusters, right? So your data may be in various places. SQL is a very popular framework, very popular uh, tool to extract data. So it, it's used for extracting, transforming, and loading data. And most databases, data warehouses, and uh, and distributed system platforms like Hadoop and Spark have an SQL-like language or SQL itself to process the data. If you have raw log files, you might have to build your own Python code to, ex to extract these log files, process them, etc. Right? The next stage is called, is called data preparation. So now you understood the business problem, you acquired the data. Again, data acquisition, I've had instances in my own professional career where data acquisition could take lots of time because first you have to understand where the data is, whether it's in a data warehouse or whether they're in a bunch of log files, understanding where the data is, all the relevant data that you care about, running lots of complex SQL queries to actually obtain all of this data into one box or one set of boxes, right? This, I mean, I had instances where this has taken me a couple of months 
I'm not joking. That, that happens a lot. Right? You have to talk to teams which own this data, which store this data, trying to understand what is the format of the data in a data warehouse or in a database table. So that, that again could take a considerable amount of time. Of course, in some cases, all the data may be sitting in just a simple database file or in a NoSQL database, and it might just be like a simple SQL query to obtain all the data. Again, data acquisition sometimes is done. So the problem understanding or the business understanding sometimes is done by product managers. Sometimes it's done by product managers, and sometimes it's done by data scientists and machine learning engineers themselves. Data acquisition, right? Frankly speaking, I have done all these roles. I've been part of all these roles, and I've had teammates who have done, product managers who have done this for me a few times. But as a young team, when the team was young, it's a machine learning engineer and the data scientists who actually do most of this work. For data acquisition, you could have data engineers. You might have data engineers in your team, right? Who, who could help you in this process. And they're very, very good with SQL. They're very good with understanding where the data is and things like that. The third step is called data preparation, right? Now, you know the business problem. You have all the data that you need. Now you need to go ahead and clean up all the data, perform all pre-processing, featureization of data and stuff like that, right? So we, we have learned, again, in our course, we have learned, uh, and in a, especially in our case studies, we spend a lot of time understanding the business problem and who is the customer, what do they want, and things like that, right? We've also spent some time on customer acquisition especially when your data is in log files. We learned, we saw a lot of Python code on how to acquire data using Python. In some of our case studies, we even use SQL to, to obtain data, right? So data preparation is where the actual data scientists work actually starts. You end up cleaning the data, pre-processing the data and things like that. Next comes your exploratory data analysis stage. We have a whole chapter in our course called EDA and we have multiple chapters where we explain data analysis itself. So wherein you plot, you since you got the data and you prepared the data, you start plotting the data, visualizing the data using multiple visualization techniques like TC that we've discussed in the course. And also you use tools and statistics like hypothesis testing. And yet at the end of the day, you slice and dice data. You break up data into multiple ways and try to understand what is happening, which feature is helping you uh, obtain the goal that you're trying to solve for your customer. This is all the exploratory data analysis stage, right? Once the exploratory, again, I've had instances where I've spent months just exploring the data, trying to understand what is happening. It, it, there are cases where I've just spent maybe a couple of days doing the performing EDA, right? So again, the amount of time depends on team to team, product to product. And if you have other teammates, if you have data engineers and product managers, they might do the first two, the first two stages and you might focus on other stages. The next thing is modeling, evaluation, and interpretation. All of your classification, regression, deep learning models, your clustering models, all of them is just this part in this life cycle. It is just one of the many, many parts. I see a lot of machine learning engineers focusing too much on the modeling part and skipping the other, other pieces of this puzzle, right? Even, though you, even, if, even if you're a brilliant modeler, right? If you do not understand and if you're not good at other stages, it's not very useful. Again, evaluation comes, evaluation deals with defining what is the KPI, what is the performance metric for your model, and how does this performance metric connect with the business requirements? And how do you interpret a model? Sometimes model interpretation is important, and sometimes it's not very important. Sometimes interpreting feature importance, right? Why is the model performing the way it is? It's especially in business critical situations, it's extremely important, right? So modeling, evaluation, and interpretation is just one of the many stages. Unfortunately, a lot of people just focus on this too much. While this is important, it is not the only stage. There are lots of other pieces of the puzzle, right? So once you have, once you have started modeling and you got some initial results, you want to communicate your results very clearly to all the stakeholders, right? Your stakeholders could be your business customers right, to whom you're building the solution your product managers, your managers themselves, your, your executives, right? You want to communicate the results very, very clearly and in a very simple fashion. Because remember, the people to whom you're communicating the results may not know machine learning. If you tell them that I have built a gradient boosted decision tree, they might say, what does that mean, 
right? So your results need to be extremely simple and clear for people to understand. At Amazon, uh, where I worked for five years, one of the very interesting methods that I've seen is any analysis or any modeling exercise, we had a process of writing just a one pager or at most six pages. You can write at most six pages of text in, in, a, in a six pager format, right? And all your results need to be communicated in no more than six pages. I actually love the one pages because they're much more crisp. You can read because only the most important things are presented in a one pager in a very simple and in a very clear manner without lots of overload of information, right? And communicating results is very, very important because you have to convince your business teams, you have to convince your own manager and his manager and your engineering teams that the solution that you have, the first cut solution that you have is good enough and we should go ahead and deploy the model in production, right? So now once you have communicated the results and got all the approvals from your managers and from the business units, and when, once they're happy, you go and deploy your model, right? Which is, which is all software engineering, mostly software engineering effort. And we've discussed how to deploy models, how to engineer models for different scenarios, etc. in our course, in the miscellaneous section, right? So once you're deploy and deploying of models sometimes is done by machine learning engineers. Sometimes you might involve distributed system engineers or software engineers or software development engineers, right? As they're sometimes called in different companies, you would need help of these people a lot when you try to deploy a model. Because these people know, the software engineers know much more than a machine learning engineer about distributed systems and especially how to deploy, how to make your system robust, stable, scalable, etc. Right? Again, by the way, there have been instances in my own professional life where where machine learning engineers actually build deployment ready systems, right? So once you've deployed your model, then you do the real, real world testing, which is the A-B testing. So you spend considerable amount of time performing A-B testing so as to see if the, all the model you've done, all the results that you got in your, on your data analysis, especially after modeling, are they really, really meaningful in a production environment? So we have, we have a very detailed discussion about A-B testing in our course where we detail out how real world A-B testing actually works, right? And it, here, here you have real, real value because you're measuring how and what happens when you take your models and show it to the end customer, when you deploy them into production, what is their true business impact? At the end of A-B testing, you need to measure your true business impact. What is the true business impact of all this effort that you've done? or all this effort that you've put in. So once, once you can measure the true business impact, you go back to the customer or the business unit that you're working with and get their buy-in, convince them with all the data, with all the experimental data, that the solution you have is good for them. Because at the end of the day, remember, it is a business unit or the customer for whom you're solving the problem. At the end of this whole thing, you need to get a buy-in from them. You need them to, to, you need them to be thoroughly convinced the solution you have built actually adds business value to them and it has impact for them and their customers, right? This is an extremely important stage. Remember, sometimes the business folks may or may not know deep machine learning. So it's your job to simplify and to present your results very crisply and clearly, right? The next thing is operationalization of things. What does operations actually mean? How to retrain your models, when to retrain your models, how to handle when there are failures in any of your pipeline. Maybe your SQL queries are failing. Maybe your modeling pipeline is breaking, right? So how to handle these failure processes and defining the whole process around how these models are retrained, how to handle failure cases, all of that is operationalization of your models, right? Once you have operationalized your models, then you go into optimization. Now you have a first cut model because you're modeling, you have the first cut model here. You have the first cut model. The model certainly can be improved. There, there is probably lots of extra analysis that you can do. There is more data that you have skipped in the first iteration because it's too cumbersome to process. So in, in, in the optimization stage, you actually go back to the drawing board and say, can I improve my model somehow? Can I go from one type of models to other type of models? Can I acquire more data? Can I, can I design more features? Can I optimize my production code? Right? All these are optimization stages and optimization is a continuously running thing. 
right? Once you build your first cut solution and deploy it, then your job is to keep optimizing each piece of this. Large companies spend years, multiple years in the optimization stage. Because once you have a first cut model, it creates business value. Imagine you build a model, you build a modeling pipeline, and let's assume it creates $1 million of business impact. Now your next goal is, can I improve models? Can I acquire more data, more features? And can I go from $1 million of business impact to let's say $1.5 million of business impact in the, in the next one year? This is the optimization stage while keeping my costs low. Right? This is the typical life cycle of a machine learning project. And remember, I may have forgotten one or two steps here and there, but this is a broad guideline. Or in some companies, probably you don't have to do some of these steps. Like for example, a data engineer might help you in data acquisition or a product manager might define the problem that you have to solve, right? Or maybe there are software engineers who are doing most of your deployment work. But a good machine learning engineer needs to be comfortable with all of these 11 stages, right? Only then he becomes a true machine learning engineer. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of people just focus on modeling. It is important to be a good, well-rounded data scientist or a machine learning engineer. You need to be able to participate in all of these stages. And in our course, we discuss each of these stages at various points and especially with our case studies.